this morning. I ask that you would fill those out and leave those in the seat, and they'll be picked up after services. Those that we want to continue to remember on a prayer list, Andy Midget, the son of Brenda Atkinson, has had his cancer return. It's in his back and his lungs, and he has started chemo pills, and the family has requested our prayers. Bailey Owens, that we've been praying for, has been transferred to the University of Louisville Heart Hospital. She has received good results for the test except for her lungs, and she is re receiving treatments on her lungs. I want to continue to remember Vicki Smith, Alan Smith's wife. Uh, she does have cancer, and it is not responding to the treatment, so we do want to continue to remember her. We are excited to announce that John Aston has formally placed his membership here with us. We also want to rejoice with John and Rhonda Fife and their grandson, John Elias, was baptized at the Spring Mill Camp last week. Upcoming activities, uh, this Wednesday night, our meal will be ribeye sandwiches, baked beans, green beans, and dessert, and this is being catered by Tom Smoking Barbecue. Please sign up in the lobby today if you plan to attend, and the cost for that meal is $4 per person. Also Wednesday, our summer series will continue. This week's speaker is Andy Conley. And the song he will be talking about this week is Holy, Holy, Holy. There are sign-up sheets in the lobby if you'd like to host a youth group Devo or the fourth and fifth grade Devo. See Josh or Emily if you have any questions. Coming up this Monday, the garage gathering for the youth group will be from 7 to 9 at Josh and Emily's. On Friday, August the 11th, we'll have breakfast together at the Eastgate Restaurant at 9.30, and everyone is welcome. Coming up on August the 16th at 5 p.m., we will be having a back-to-school bash for the kids age 2 through 5th grade. There will be bounce houses and pizza before a regular Wednesday night service. This event is free and is for our kids as well as their friends and other members of the community. There will be school supplies available for the kids and we are asking members to bring those school supplies. There's a sign up sheet in the lobby for the items that we need and how many. And this is an outreach of our children's ministry. That's all the announcements I have. Those that will be participating in our worship service this evening our opening prayer will be by Josh Terry. Carl Powers will be leading our singing. Scripture reading by Bob McIndoo. Lesson of the hour will be by David Salisbury. And Matt Grissom will have our closing prayer.
If you would, pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time where we can come together and, and hear a portion of your word given to us, Lord. We pray that you be with David as he delivers his message that he's prepared tonight. We pray that he can uh, remember all the things that he studied and that they can be imparted to us, Lord, and that we can take that knowledge and, and continue to spread your wisdom and your, your word throughout this world. Lord, at this time, we want to hold up to you all those that are sick and suffering on our prayer list. We want to hold up to you, uh, Miss Brenda's son and Mr. Allen's wife, or yeah, Mr. Allen's wife, and we also want to hold up to you, JB's brother. Lord, we have all these people that are on our prayer list and in our hearts and our minds. We ask that you watch over them and that you help them in any way that you possibly can, Lord. We're so grateful for this uh, time of worship and singing that we get to have with you tonight, Lord, and we, we pray that it lifts us up and encourages us, Lord. We're so grateful for the fact that you love us and the fact that you sent your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture tonight will be taken from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ is the Son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for being here tonight. It's been a, a good day. We worshiped together this morning. Josh and I were able to go to Pleasant Point this afternoon and lead the worship service out there and enjoyed that. And we've had some folks who visited from there and also expressed their interest in coming to be with us. And I appreciate the opportunity we get to do that for them once a month. And tonight, as we continue looking at the book of Hebrews and talking about things that are better you know, I'm old enough to remember the days when you could get a cell phone for just a penny as long as you'd sign up for a brand new contract. In fact, you could get them for free, but then they upped the price to a penny. And then all that disappeared and all of a sudden phones began to cost hundreds of dollars. And then they started putting a comma in there on the price of phones. And all of a sudden this new industry emerged because when you spend uh, you know, $1,200 on your cell phone, then, then you'll spend money on a screen protector for it and an OtterBox case for it because you want to protect that phone. And, and then you'll buy that insurance policy just in case all those things fail. And maybe you've even had that experience of watching your phone fall or, or seeing it somewhere or maybe just hearing that crunch 
as you realize that in spite of all your best efforts, the screen protector did not protect and the OtterBox case did not save the phone that was in it. And maybe you called that 800 number because, hey, you bought the insurance policy. And they said, sure, no problem. We'll be happy to replace that for you. Now, a replacement phone costs $450, and we'll ship that out to you in the next five to six weeks. And you kind of felt like you'd been had. Man, I paid all this money. I paid for the protection. I paid for the case. I paid for the insurance policy. And you, you sort of feel betrayed. You know, I trusted the process. I trusted what they said. And, and you feel let down. Maybe, maybe you've been through a, a betrayal of your trust that's a whole lot more serious than a cell phone insurance policy. Maybe you trusted a person and they let you down, a friend who shared what should have been secret, a spouse who was unfaithful, a family that broke apart when you thought it would last forever, a spiritual leader or a hero, somebody you looked up to only to watch them fall from grace into sin and you were shocked and maybe you even wondered, who do I trust anymore? It seems like you can't trust anybody it's a question that we ask at least ourselves. Maybe we say it out loud, maybe we don't. But, but every time someone we love or trust or look up, looks up, look up to ends up falling into sin or deception or hurting us, betraying us, we wonder, who do I trust? And maybe there's even that moment you think, well, I'm just not going to trust anybody. And, and you begin to, to ask yourself, who do I trust? Tonight as we look at the book of Hebrews, we need this lesson. Hebrews keeps coming back to us saying that Jesus is a better option. Jesus is a better option. And as we move through those first two chapters, Jesus we saw is better than any person that, that any, we've ever known, better than the angels, better than the prophets. But tonight in chapter 3, we're going to say, see where Jesus is the best option for us to put our trust in. Hebrews chapter 3 begins in verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house we are, if we hold fast that confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Hebrews chapter 3 begins with that word, therefore. It wants us to look and say, therefore, holy brethren. And so it's based on everything we saw in chapters 1 and 2. If you haven't been with us as we've been moving through Hebrews, we're going verse by verse. We're not skipping anything. And Hebrews 1 and 2 says that Jesus is the express image of God. When you saw Jesus, you saw God in the flesh. That he's better than the angels because he is the son of God. Jesus would say in John 14, 9, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Jesus is the son of God. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is he's the son of God who came to earth. Jesus was fully God and also fully human. He was flesh and bones. He cried real tears. He really laughed with the children who came to him. He really bled when they beat him and nailed him to a cross. Jesus was fully human. In fact, we looked at these verses last week from Hebrews chapter 4. And as much as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through his death, or through death, he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to to bondage. Jesus put on flesh and blood so that he could come and live this life among us. He shared in our experience so that he could conquer death once for all. God, we saw last week, was mindful of us. He thought about us. Jesus humbled himself for us. He suffered for us so that death would be conquered for us. And because of all that, Hebrews 2 said he's able to help those of us who are being tempted, which is all of us. So chapter 1, Jesus is the Son of God. He is fully God. Chapter 2, Jesus is also fully human. And chapter 3 says, therefore, holy brethren, because that's who Jesus is. This is who we are, holy brethren. This book is written to Christians who are struggling with their faith. They were wondering if maybe they should go back to their old ways of Judaism. And, and the writer reminds them that they are holy they're holy because God made them holy in Christ Jesus. They're brethren because they're part of church family, because God adopted them into the family of God. These are the ones who he said have answered the heavenly calling. 
You heard the call of the gospel and you answered. You heard the invitation and you responded. You were the ones who said, sign us up. These are Christians. The gospel unashamedly calls Christians to live holy lives. Therefore, holy brethren, he says, remember the life that you are supposed to live. And if that doesn't sound like a good thing, if you say, hey, I don't know if I want to be holy or not. I'm not sure holy is an adjective I want to describe me. Then you definitely need to read the rest of the book of Hebrews. We have a problem because we were called to be holy. And he says, remember who you are in Christ Jesus. The NIV says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. That's literally what the answer is here. This practice alone can do so much for our faith. He says, consider Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. It's easy to look at all kinds of other things. It's easy to get hurt by people and events and look at that. It's easy to say, I don't like this. It didn't go my way that time and get caught up in that. It's easy to dive off into all sorts of crazy theological questions that are way on the sidelines. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says, hold on just a minute. Let's bring our focus back. Let's fix our thoughts on Jesus. Let's come back to the most important thing. Let's get back to Jesus. Fix your thoughts. The word means to actively consider. It's an intentional effort. You won't do it accidentally. You won't do it naturally. You have to say, you know what? Hold on just a minute. I'm going to consciously redirect my thoughts to Jesus. I want to study Jesus. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to make him the focal point of my study. I want to give my undivided attention to him. So why is it that God would call these Jewish Christians to set aside everything else and fix their thoughts on Jesus for the same reason that he wants us to? The same reason that it was good advice for them is why it's good advice for us. When we put aside all of our preconceived notions, all of our prideful desires, all of our comfort, all of our security, when we set me aside and say, wait a minute, I'm going to focus on Jesus then we're in the right frame of mind to really understand God's will. If we focus on Jesus, we're looking at the one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why is it we focus on Jesus? Because if we look anywhere besides Jesus, if we focus on anything other than Jesus, if we're looking for truth or meaning or, or value, if we say this is what's most important, if we prioritize anything other than Jesus, then we will inevitably settle for less then God's best for us because Jesus is the best. Throughout Hebrews, Jesus is called better. He's better than this and better than that. We've looked at angels and prophets, and now we're going to talk about Moses. Everything comes back to Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Wherever you might look for value and meaning and truth, Jesus is better. And as we've said all along, if you're better than all the rest, then you're by default the best. Jesus is God's best for us. And if we look anywhere else, we're settling for something less. And so if we can put aside all of our prideful uh, desires, if we can put aside all of that and focus on Jesus, then we will be looking where we ought to. Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. The writer says we should consider that, that he is the apostle. The word apostle simply means one sent. Jesus had apostles. We've studied them and looked at them in the Gospels. They're those ones that he sent out. The word is used sometimes in a less formal way for any messenger who's sent. But Jesus is himself an apostle. He was sent by God. He was given a mission by God. He came to us. He's the original apostle. But he's more than that. He's the high priest. And that's not something you and I relate to very often. But for these Jewish Christians, they knew all about the high priesthood. The high priest was the one the people sent to God. He offered sacrifices on their behalf. He carried them before God, and he represented them before God. So Jesus is the perfect go-between. Because as the apostle and high priest, he is the one who comes from God to us and goes from us to God. And in the same person, Jesus Christ, he's the perfect person for that. That's the confession that we make. That's the confession we make at baptism. I believe Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus, the man on earth, is the son of God, come from heaven and now return to it. For the Jews, they had their hero of faith. Moses was as good as it gets, the original lawgiver. He was their apostle and high priest originally, though his brother Aaron held that office. Before that, Moses was the one who was sent by God, sent from the desert back into Egypt to, to go and deliver a message from God of freedom from exile. 
He, he was there and interceded with them before God. As they traveled out of Egypt, it was Moses who would go to God on their behalf. So he functioned in both roles. And Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him. And the writer of Hebrews said, you want to know who's faithful to the mission he was given? Moses was. He did what God asked him to do. If you were a Jew and you had Moses on your side, that was it. And the Hebrews writer said, actually, if you want to do one better than Moses, you've got Jesus on your side. They knew Moses. He was faithful to God. In Numbers chapter 12, it's one of, one of the only times that Moses' authority was questioned, this time by his own family. Aaron, his brother, Miriam, his sister, they got together and said, hey, we're not sure you should be the leader. And God shows up and personally says, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in, vision, in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. Look at what God pronounced there. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God takes up for Moses. He chastises Mir Miriam and Aaron for speaking against him. And he says, Moses, in all my house, in all the people that serve me, Moses is faithful in all my house. Jewish Christians knew that story. They knew what it meant to be faithful in all God's house. That's Moses. That's his job. What they didn't know is Jesus was even greater. And the Hebrews writer goes through and draws several comparisons for us says, if you like Moses, you're going to love Jesus. If you thought Moses was good, let me tell you, Jesus is better. Moses, verse 3, was worthy of honor and glory. Jesus is worthy of more honor and more glory. Moses was part of God's house. That's a great honor to be part of God's house. Jesus was the builder of God's house. Moses was a servant in God's house. Jesus is the son of in God's house. Moses was a testimony. He was looking ahead. What Moses did in his life was a, a picture that was designed to point ahead toward one who would fulfill his imagery. Moses himself said, one day God's going to raise up a prophet like me. Jesus is the one that Moses was pointing to. Moses was a testimony. Jesus is the one he was looking toward. Moses was good, but Jesus is better. Moses was faithful. He was a faithful servant in God's house in the role that he was given. But Jesus is perfectly faithful. You can trust him. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. And while we miss sometimes some of the Old Testament imagery and high priest and Moses and all that, we don't catch all the nuances that Jewish Christians would. They struggled with, who do you trust? Who do you count on? And they're like, you know, we know Moses. We can trust Moses. They were living out their faith. They were following Jesus. And they said, this is hard. It's not going so well. Maybe Jesus is not trustworthy. And yet, the writer of Hebrews said, you can trust Jesus. He is God's son. He is the builder. He's the ruler of the house. The house is his church. He declared to Peter after Peter made that good confession. He said, you're Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. He's the builder of God's house. He's the best you'll ever get. And there's one thing that it's easy to kind of run right past there in those last two verses, verses 5 and 6. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now, I told you sometimes we miss a little bit of the appreciation that those Jewish Christians would have had for how he talks about Moses and that Old Testament house. But that word in verse 5 that's used for a servant in God's house, it's only used here in the entire New Testament. It doesn't mean a slave. It means a voluntary servant. Moses chose to serve God. He was an honored servant. Moses was unique in all God's house, whose house we are. Moses was designed to show God's people, here's what it's like to have that apostle and high priest. The one who represents God to us and us to God. A mediator, a go-between. But Moses wasn't perfect. You know the story of Moses. 
He left the desert and went, out in, or went back into Egypt. He brought the people out of Egypt, led them across the Red Sea, led them through the desert. They wandered for 40 years because of their own unbelief. And Moses brought them right to the promised land. He got them so close that Moses could stand on the edge and look over and see it. But Moses couldn't go in. His own sin... His own imperfection caused Moses to come up just a little bit short. In fact, it wasn't Moses, it was Joshua who brought him in. Now, we'll save this for another sermon sometime, but Joshua is the Hebrew form of the Greek name, Jesus. And it is Joshua who leads the children of God into the promised land. And as we come into the New Testament, here the writer of Hebrews says, let's look to Jesus, our Joshua to lead us into the promised land. Moses said and did all those things looking forward to Jesus, who's the son over the house. And you and I can be part of the house of God. It's easy to run right past that. Whose house we are. Oh, that's incredible. We can be part of the household of God. We can be part of the family of God. You say, yeah, I know, because we've read that God adopts us as his child. We understand all of that. But stop and think about that for a moment. Last week, we looked at how great a salvation we've been offered. We've been offered a place in the family of God. We've been offered the opportunity, like Moses, to voluntarily choose to be a servant in God's house, to be part of the household of God. It's written to Christians. They were in the household of God. He says, whose house we are. These are folks who've already made that choice. They've decided. They've been saved. They've been added to the house. And he says, if we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of hope, if they walked away from Jesus, which is what they were struggling with, if they gave up and quit, they would leave the household of God. They were voluntary servants. And if they chose to stop, they could walk away. We were added to the house by placing our faith in Christ Jesus. Now we need to hold fast to the confidence we had. When you became a Christian, you trusted that God would forgive your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. That confidence you had in Jesus, you have to hold on to it. We hold fast to that confidence. He, he says, you trusted Jesus, don't stop now. We're not saved by our obedience, but if we walk away, we walk away from Jesus, the source of our salvation, the author of our salvation. Instead, we need to, the New King James says, hold fast, hold tight. No matter what happens, we cling to Jesus no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what disappointments come, no matter how many times we think, who can I trust? We hold tight to Jesus because he is faithful. He's worthy of our trust. So we hold fast to that confidence. Our lives in Christ are marked by that confidence. They're also marked by rejoicing and hope. Are you glad to be a Christian? Make sure and notify your face. Let folks know. You know, as we celebrate what, we, what we've been given in Christ Jesus, it should show up in the rejoicing in our lives and the hope we have. Jesus is above everyone so that he can save anyone. And because he can save anyone, he can save everyone. No one is beyond the reach of Jesus' power to save. He's the best. Moses could be a, a faithful servant in God's house. Moses worked with the Jews, but you had to be part uh, of the Jewish nation in order to be saved through Moses' revelation of God's law. But Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. It's a simple point to the whole lesson tonight. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, period. You say, man, I'm struggling with my faith. Then fix your thoughts on Jesus. Man, I'm really hurting. I, I've been let down. I, I've been disappointed. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm stressed. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. I don't know if I've got it left in me to be the faithful Christian I'm supposed to be. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. He is our only hope. He's the only hope you have. He's the only hope your family has. He's the only hope your neighbors have, your co-workers have. He's the only hope this world has. And that's great news because if Jesus is the only hope, man, what a hope we have. He's the best. He's God's best. And God sent him for us. It means that everyone needs to know Jesus. Our hope is confident because Jesus is that good. Jesus is better than all the rest. 
And so because our hope is in Jesus and he's that good, he's better than anything else, then the only question we need to ask is, have we placed our hope in him? Maybe tonight you say, man, I need to become part of the household of God. Whose house you are, man, I want in on that. I want to be part of the people of God. Jesus is your way in. Jesus offers you salvation. He paid a debt that you could never pay. He took on himself our sins. By his stripes, we're healed. Because of what he did on the cross, we have forgiveness. And forgiveness means hope. So maybe tonight you say, you know what, I, I want in. Jesus offers a, a way of salvation. He says, you know what, we'll, we'll swap places. I'll take what you deserve and you take what I earned. I'll take the punishment you deserve and you can have the reward that I earned. When we repent of our sins, when we acknowledge, you know what, you're right and I'm wrong. That's what repentance means. It changes the way I think. I'm not going the way I used to. I've changed my thinking and now I'm going to follow God's ways. I have repented of my sins. When I confess my faith, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the only hope I've got. When we make that public confession, when we're baptized to have our sins washed away, in Acts chapter 2, we read that God adds them to the church. In Romans, we read that he adopts us as his child. We're part of the household of God because of what Jesus did. Maybe tonight you say, that's what I need to do. It's time. I need to make that commitment. Maybe it's time to become a Christian. Or perhaps tonight, as you've read these words that are addressed to those who'd already made that commitment and encourages them, hold fast to the confidence. Maybe tonight you say, I need to strengthen my grip. I need to hang on. Life's been hard. Maybe you look at life and you say, I I've drifted away. We talked about the danger of drifting. Maybe you look and you just say, I don't know how much strength I've got left. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. And tonight, maybe you say, I, I need to hold fast to the confession I've made. I need to live that life of holiness as part of the family of God. Tonight, if you need to come to the Lord or come back to him, if we can help you, won't you come right now as we stand and sing?
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this day. We're thankful for this opportunity to come together and, and learn more about you. We pray that we focus on you and live for you, Lord, and others might see you through us. We just ask that you watch over and guide us, keep us safe. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.